Want to get more sales without being salesy? Well, you've come to the right place. Check this out. This is the Sales Gorilla Podcast. All right, Gorilla Army Nation, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Sales Gorilla Podcast with your host, the Sales Gorilla himself, Landon Porter. Landon, how are you doing today? I'm awesome sauce, Mr. Frazier. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. And before we jump into it, last week, we talked about the Gillette commercial and how they, uh, they had a, a little bit of a fiasco and people went on a, a tangent of, of saying, I'm never going to buy Gillette again. And you said it didn't affect you either way, but I noticed you haven't been shaving since then. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> back when I used razors, Gillette, I think, was the brand of razors that I used. I haven't used an actual razor on my face in 10 or 15 years. Beard trimmers work so much better, and there's this company called – I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> here's, here's, here's the deal with me, right? Um, I don't know what the fiasco was with Gillette. I don't give a shit. Like, I don't care. They, in my opinion, are not a moral standard – deciding factor in my life they make a decent razor if i'm going to go buy a throwaway razor it's probably going to be gillette and i don't give a shit what their stance is right now let me clarify that a little bit if they if they came out and said we're all about like human trafficking and right <laughs> like if they came out and did something like that then i'd be like no but by and large bigger companies and their stance on politics or religion or sexuality or sexism or like i don't care if i'm gonna buy a razor i'm gonna buy a razor yeah i think also the thing that most people didn't realize about it is whoever made the decision to cast that commercial it was probably a pr decision it was probably a marketing decision it was probably not something that somebody was like i adamantly believe this and i'm gonna inject it into our marketing it was probably like well we think the we think think that our audience probably wants to hear something about this or we want to avoid being called a certain ism so we probably should get out in front of it and and put this commercial out there and uh i I guess that's what you risk when you when you run a business you risk the fact that some some of your actions are gonna turn off some people at the uh at the behest of other people have you ever met a perfect human yes landon porter (laughs) Oh God. <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> okay, let's 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 be real and let's get into the podcast. Do it. Okay, so what are we gonna be talking about today? So in in the podcast episode last week, I, I kind of went on a little bit of a rant about the whole you know, really it's all about building relationships and and yeah. If you're going to do a thing, do it right the first time, do it for the long term, like play to win the long game. But there's a lot of people in my world, but there's a lot of people in my world that go, but Landon, I need clients like right now. And some of them are brand new. Some of them are like new in business and they're trying to get a thing going. But there's a lot of them that have been doing their thing for like a long fucking time. Like we're not talking six months. We're talking like five, six, seven years. And it's frustrating to me because we're all placing our focus and our attention and doing activities that are counterintuitive to winning that. If you've been in business three, four, five, six years, really, you should have it figured out by now and you should have the client acquisition thing licked. Could it be better? It can always be better. But not to be a jerk, if you're in a situation where you're good at the thing that you do and you've done it for years and the client acquisition thing is a problem, there's only two times to plant a tree if you want it shading your house. 20 years ago and today. So if you haven't been doing this stuff 20 years ago, you better start doing it today so in three years you're not in the same situation. I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, I still deal with this and I've been writing copy for uh, going on six years now. And I only usually take on one or two clients at a time. I have a couple of standby clients that I, that I work for on a weekly or monthly basis, but I take on a big job every two or three months. And then 
um, when I run out of money, I, I still scramble <laughs> to find a new client. And man, I, you're making me feel bad for admitting this, but I'm guilty of what you're talking about. So I went from being perfect to insulting you in the same episode, like literally in less than five minutes. <laughs> you, were, you were never perfect. I was just trying to, I was just trying to keep you as a client. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and in all seriousness, most people, most people deal with this because the idea of scrambling and like, this is the real estate agent's dilemma right? I prospect and prospect and prospect all month long. And next month I have like four closings. And the month after that, I've got two or three and like, it's, it's okay. But those two months where I was doing those closings, I was so busy dealing with those people that I didn't have time to prospect. So now those deals are closed and I don't have a pipeline. Right. But Real estate agents that have a consistent business that they do five, six, seven deals or eight or nine deals or 12 or 15 deals every month, month in, month out. They're not any better. They're not like amazing compared to the most, the majority that it's like this roller coaster, right? But they figured something out. They've figured out that it's a marathon and not a sprint. Right? I mean, this whole client acquisition roller coaster thing is a disaster. It's a nightmare. It sucks to live in. And you shouldn't be ashamed and you shouldn't be embarrassed. But like, we're on episode 32 of the podcast, and I've been talking about the same shit for two years to a group of 15,000 people. If not now, when? Right? It's just a simple change. It's a marathon instead of a sprint. It's a slightly different activity that you do on a regular ongoing basis instead of stop and start and stop and start. Okay. So you mentioned the two best times to plant a tree. One of them being 20 years ago, the next best time being today. And in my business, I, 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 maybe I exaggerated. It's not always like feast or famine. I do have some system set up where I have ongoing clients. I have continuity programs. I have other offers that I can, that I can promote. I have a couple of forms of passive income. Um, but I definitely do feel the hurt. I definitely do. I do experience the, okay, I just closed this job. I need to figure out who my next client is going to be, or I need to hit up previous clients and see if they need any more work or, and occasionally, and more and more frequently, actually, I'll have it to be where as I'm wrapping up a job, somebody will be like, hey, are you available for work? And I'll be like, hey, if you can get a hold of me on Friday, I can definitely start talking to you. I just have to give my attention to finishing up this job. But I don't have a conscious plan that I'm going about creating this reality. And so I'm going to ask you, what can I be doing to, to move more consciously towards that, that ultimate ideal situation? Mm -hmm. Let's think about this from two different perspectives. The way that you've been going about it now mostly is I get a client, I do the work, and then I go find another client. And you've been doing it well enough and long enough now that for the most part, by the time you wrap up a project, somebody's falling out of your pipeline and saying, hey, I want to, the way I see that is you're like 70 or 80% close to having a wait list. So you do this activity, right? You need a client. So you go get a client, all of that activity and all of that peopling and all of that reaching out to people and all of that initiating conversation. It happens in this one big push and you get a client and now you do the client work until that client work is done. And then you go back to doing that. There's this big push to reach out to people and connect with people, right? And if you look at that on a timeline, it's like lots of activity, peopling, and then a little bit of activity working for a client. Lots of people, activity, and then working with a client. Well, what if you spread that lots of peopling out instead of it being a sprint, it was a marathon, and you did a little bit of it on a consistent, regular basis. That's the shift here. That's all we're talking about. And if you do that for a long enough period of time, now you begin to create a wait list for yourself. So instead of it being, 
I need to go find a client. Oh, thank God somebody fell out of my pipeline because I've actually been doing enough of the right things the last six or 12 months. By accident. It's by accident. Now it's planned and you go, cool, I've got this client project that I'm in the middle of. And after that, I'm working with so-and-so. And then I've, I'm already in talks with somebody to be the person after that. And if you keep that rolling like that to where you've got one or two people that are waiting to start with you before you're even finished with the client that you're working on now and you keep doing the marathon things, just a little bit, it's just a little bit of activity, peopling on a regular ongoing basis, the wait list gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the difference. Okay. And what are your thoughts, and this might be beyond the scope, but what are your thoughts about once you have that wait list, figuring out ways to scale to where you're not having to tell people, yeah, I can help you, but not for six months? Raise your prices. Okay. I mean, that's a, good, that's a great answer. So they, they work in tandem. Building a wait list at your current rates works to an extent. Most people aren't going to wait six months to work with most other people, right? I, if I need a copywriter, dude, I need one now. Like I can wait a few weeks, but if I need a copywriter, like we're looking at it now, mm -hmm. right? If we're looking to hire somebody to be our guy ongoing on retainer, that, okay, cool. We're going to handle some shit now and in six months we'll connect and, and if all's well with us, communication wise, between now and then and the relationship's still good, I'm going to hire you, right? They work in tandem. You build a little bit of a wait list cool, I can't start on your stuff for like two weeks until I'm done with this current project, right? And then the next person, we're looking at like 20 to 30 days before I can start working on your project because I'm, I'm wrapping one up. Cool, well, that third or fourth person you put on that wait list, now we're out like five or six, seven weeks. You slow, slowly raise your prices by 10, 15, 25%. If they're willing to stick around and wait, fantastic. That's your new set rate. And then anybody else new that comes to you, you dude, I've, I've got a wait list. It's going to be like two and a half, three months before I can get to you. If you're good with that, then I'd be happy to take a deposit and you're, that's your spot in line. As soon as I get done with that project, you're next. See, this all makes it sound a lot more appealing to me than what I've been doing so far. Hey, you know, if you want to go to prom with a pretty girl, you don't wait until like the weekend before prom to go talk to pretty girls. If you're smart about it, you're going to be building relationships with all the pretty girls for like the year. So you get to have your pick, right? You're a dog, Landon. Totally. <laughs> Getting clients and getting a date is the exact same thing. There's a lot of overlap, that's for sure. Okay, so let's just do a recap on this real quick. If you want to have a better, a more filled pipeline when it comes to acquiring new clients, what are some of the things to keep in mind? It's an ongoing thing. I, in sales, there's this term, ABC, always be closing. That's bullshit. It's always be connecting. If you want to have a business that sustains itself through client acquisition, it is a slow burn, long game process of always be connecting with highly targeted, very specific people that you would absolutely love to work with and building a relationship with them. And that's so hard in our microwave popcorn, push a button and I want results 30 seconds from now. It goes against what everybody wants, but in reality, that's what you have to do. We've all got to stop this game of starting and hurrying up and then stopping and slamming on the brakes and then freaking out. And, oh my God, and we got to like, right? Like think about it. When you get in your car and you turn your car on and you put your car in gear, you don't slam on the gas and you're immediately at a hundred miles an hour, but that's what a lot of people are doing in their business. It doesn't work that way. Okay, where can people go if they want to check out more episodes of the podcast? We do this over at salesgorillapodcast.com. Nice. All right, man. We will catch you later. Peace out, Cub Scouts. Hey, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. I love some of you. <laughs>